Hello and welcome to Forensic Psychology Lesson 1. In this lesson we are going to be looking at the top-down approach to offender profiling, which is an American approach to profiling. So as part of this video we're going to be looking at the intricacies of top-down profiling. We're going to have a look at what it is, where it came from, and then we are going to apply it to some examples of real-life serial killers. We'll then have a look at some evaluation points and then we'll end up with an example of a six mark outline for this topic at the end. So offender profiling is a tool that's employed by the police when solving crimes. The main aim is to narrow down the field of inquiry and the list of likely suspects. It's based on the idea that characteristics of an offender can be deduced from the characteristics of the crime and also the particulars of the crime scene. And although the methods may vary depending on the actual profiler, the compiling of a profile usually involves careful scrutiny of the crime scene and analysis of the evidence, including witness reports, in order to generate a hypothesis about the probable characteristics of the offender. For example, their age, their background, their occupation, and so on. So as I said earlier, we're going to be starting with the American approach to profiling, the top-down approach. And this approach came from a series of interviews that were carried out by the FBI in the 1970s with 36 sexually motivated killers, 25 of which were serial killers. Examples of sexually motivated serial killers include Ted Bundy, Charles Manson, um, but also John Wayne Gacy, Ed Kemper, the Green River Killer those types of people. From those interviews, it was concluded that the crimes could be categorized into either organized or disorganized. Both categories having certain characteristics which meant that if in a future situation the data from a crime scene matched characteristics of one or the other category, other characteristics about the offender could then be predicted. That could then be used to find the offender, or at least to narrow down your list of suspects. Top-down profilers generally collect data about a murder and then decide on the category that the data best fits. And because of that, it's known as a typology approach, because the offender ends up being one type of offender or another. The idea of organized and disorganized offenders is based on this concept that serious offenders have a certain signature way of working, and that these signatures generally correlate with a particular set of social and psychological characteristics that relate to the individual. The characteristics of organized and disorganized offenders are contrasted in the table that you can see on the screen now, and as you can see, they are pretty much the direct opposite of one another. So for example, um, an organized offender tends to plan quite meticulously, whereas a disorganized offender doesn't. Because an organized offender plans, he generally or she generally shows high levels of control. They're generally very tidy in that they don't leave very many clues or evidence. And obviously a disorganized offender is then the exact opposite. So they have very little control. They're very spontaneous. They don't have a type. They're very impulsive. And the crime scene reflects that with DNA and evidence left behind. And the body is very often still at the crime scene and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so on the next two slides, we'll use some real-life examples to just kind of make it clear what an organized and a disorganized offender could look like in terms of their behavior um, and what it is that they would do. We'll use Ted Bundy as our organized offender. So Ted Bundy graduated law school in 1972. Um, so he was classed as charming, intelligent, and articulate. He had a girlfriend and he also had a type, specifically young college girls, and you can see some of his victims on the screen now, all kind of looking very similar. He often used a ruse or a trick to draw his victims in, so for example, he would wear his arm in a sling or his leg in a fake cast, and then ask his victims for help. He'd then grab them, bind them, and throw them in the back of his car or his van, which shows a certain degree of planning and control. When he was first arrested, a search of his car yielded masks, handcuffs, and rope, again, which suggests that he actually planned his crimes 
and he then actually confessed to 30 murders, but a lot of his victims were never found, and so the true number of his victims actually remains unknown. The fact that many of them were never found also indicates a high level of intelligence um, and a high level of planning as well. Intelligence is obviously also uh, indicated by the fact that he graduated university. So if you compare Ted Bundy to the checklist of organized characteristics, you can say that he actually planned his crimes, he left no or very little evidence, he definitely had a type, he was definitely skilled, socially and sexually competent, and exerted high levels of control over his actions. Now if you compare that to Richard Chase, who is a disorganized offender, he was known as the Vampire of Sacramento because he drank the blood of animals and also his victims. He was in and out of mental health institutions, he lived with his parents all by himself, had no social life or girlfriend, and abused drugs and alcohol. He also had no victim type, so much so that one of his murders involved a middle-aged woman, a man, a six-year-old, and a 22-month-old as well, all in the same household. His murders were opportunistic in that they weren't planned. He literally walked the streets checking doors, and by his own admission, if the door was open, it meant that you are welcome and that you can come in, and if the door was locked, it meant that you weren't welcome, and so you would leave and walk away. There was also no effort to conceal his crimes, and so he often left the victims behind, and he was often seen with bloody clothes or blood on his face. Um, you know, the, the crime scenes reflected the impulsivity in that they were very messy, um, lots of blood everywhere, lots of DNA everywhere. And he was eventually convicted of six murders and was ultimately identified by somebody that he went to school with, showing that he didn't really venture too far from home or from the place that he grew up. So again, if we compare this to the disorganized checklist, you can see that he ticks quite a few of the disorganized offender boxes. Very little evidence of planning, very spontaneous spur of the moment kind of crimes, very little control, very impulsive, a history of sexual dysfunction or relationship dysfunction, lives alone and close to the crime scene. Okay, so that's just a way that you can kind of see what this would look like in the real world. So just a little bit then of outline just to finish off before we move on to the evaluation points. There are four main stages in the construction of an FBI profile. You have data assimilation, crime scene classification, crime reconstruction, and profile generation. So data assimilation involves reviewing the evidence. So that includes crime scene photographs, pathology reports, witness reports, and so on. Crime scene classification involves deciding whether it's an organized or a disorganized crime. Crime reconstruction is all about generating a hypothesis in terms of the sequence of events and the behavior of the victim and the suspect. And then finally, profile generation is all about creating a hypothesis relating to the likely offender. So, for example, the demographic background, physical characteristics, psychological characteristics, behavior, and so on. Okay, so all FBI profiles tend to go through these four stages in their creation. Okay, so that is your outline information. Let's move on to have a look at a few evaluation points. I've got three and a bit evaluation points for you, so that should be plenty for any essay that you should ever have to write on this topic. So first off, let's start with a strength, and that is research support. Now, there is support for a distinct organized category of offender. In order to test the organized disorganized typology, which is central to the top down approach, David Cantor in 2004 conducted an analysis of 100 US murders, each committed by a different serial killer. He used a technique called smallest space analysis, which is a statistical technique that identifies correlations across different samples of behavior. In this case, the analysis was used in order to assess the occurrence of 39 aspects of serial killing. And those aspects included things like whether or not there was torture or restraint present, whether or not there was an attempt to conceal the body, what the form of murder weapon was, and what the cause of death was. 
Now, the analysis revealed that there did seem to be a set of features of many serial killings that matched the FBI typology for organized offenders, which then suggests that a key component of the FBI typology approach has some validity because there was research support for those features of organized offenders. However, there is a counterpoint to that, which says that many studies actually suggest that the organized and disorganized types are not mutually exclusive. There are actually a variety of combinations that occur at any given murder scene. For example, Godwin in 2002 argues that in reality, it's difficult to classify killers as one or the other type because a killer might have multiple contrasting characteristics, such as high levels of intelligence and high levels of sexual competence, but equally might then commit a spontaneous murder, leaving the victim's body at the scene of the crime. So that suggests that the organized, disorganized typology might not necessarily be a one or the other type deal, but is probably more of a continuum where people exist somewhere along the continuum, but not necessarily at one extreme end or another, but somewhere in between the two. Okay, so this is a nice evaluation point to kind of start with, and you'll definitely get a nice amount of marks for a point like this, provided you get both the main point and the counterpoint in as well. Okay, so moving on, we have another strength. Um, and that is that it can be adapted to other types of crime, such as burglary. Now, initially, critics of the top-down approach claimed that the technique only really applies to a limited number of crimes, like murder, rape, and arson. However, Makita, in 2017, reported that the top-down approach has recently been applied to burglary, leading to an 85% rise in solved cases in three separate US states. Now, in this case, the organized-disorganized distinction was kept. However, they also added two new categories, which were interpersonal and opportunistic. Interpersonal burglaries referred to burglaries where the victim and the burglar knew each other and something of significance was stolen, whereas an opportunistic crime was more related to young and inexperienced criminals. So that suggests that top-down profiling actually has a wider op application than was originally assumed, which is, of course, a good thing. And then finally, we have a limitation, which is all about the sample. Now, the top-down approach was based on interviews conducted with 36 murderers. The problem is that sample is very, very poor. So serial killers and murderers are an unrepresentative sample because they didn't take any of the other criminals that were in prison into account at the time. 36 people isn't a large sample, and it also isn't a random sample as well. There were no standardized questions, which means that comparisons between the different interviews aren't possible, or at least are very, very hard. And also, as a final note, self-report information from convicted criminals may be inaccurate for a variety of reasons. Firstly, they may lie due to social desirability and not wanting to admit the crimes to an interviewer, um, particularly if they're hoping for an appeal or something like that, admitting crimes might actually get in the way of that. Also, they could exaggerate their crimes because they want the notoriety and the fame for their actions. So again, the whole truth might not actually be given, which then could lead to inaccuracies. So all of that suggests that the top-down approach does not actually have a sound scientific basis, and there was a lot of methodological issues when these interviews were initially carried out. Okay, so just to finish off, um, obviously this is a paper three topic, which means that you, know, you could very well get an essay on this, um, and so alongside your three and a bit evaluation points, you are gonna need a six mark outline. So if I was writing a six mark outline, mine would look a little bit something like this. A little bit of an introductory paragraph about what the top-down approach to profiling actually is and where it came from. Um, a little sentence about what the purpose 
of those two characteristics is, although if I'm honest, that sentence there could probably be taken out. Um, and then a paragraph each or a little bit of information each on both of the types, so organized and disorganized. You'll see there that I've got a little bit less information on disorganized as I have on organized, but that's simply because I've kind of said that it's the exact opposite so you can just kind of cut that down a little bit. If you give a little bit more information in the organized bit, then you can just kind of leave out a little bit of the details in disorganized because like I said, they are effectively the exact opposite from each other. Um, the word count that I've got there is around 180 words, which is towards the top end of what you should be writing. So if you find that you are a little bit of a slower writer or that you sometimes struggle with the timings, then that second sentence that I've got in there, you could get rid of that and then you could jump straight into the organized versus disorganized distinctions. Um, but that's just what I would do. Um, obviously, there are a load of different ways that you could write this outline. So if you want to do it in a bit of a different way, then that's fine. Or if you want to take little bits and pieces from what I've done and then kind of weave it into your own outline, then that's obviously fine as well. This is just an example of what it could look like. Okay, so that is the end of Forensic Psychology Lesson 1. Um, I hope it's been useful and I hope it's all made sense. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.